God is a God of fresh starts, second chances, and new beginnings. And if you could use some, if you're in need of some glory days, then you're at the right place. Welcome to a study of Joshua, the book, and the man. God gave Joshua and the children of Israel a promise to enter the promised land. They experienced glory days, and he offers the same promise to you. Let's begin with the declaration of our glory days promise. Fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope and say it like you mean it. These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true and his word is sure. With God as my helper, I will be all he wants me to be, do all he wants me to do, and receive all he wants me to receive. These days are glory days. Lord, have mercy, please, now upon the one who speaks, for his sins are many. And grant that we might see Jesus in these words and sense your presence. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Amen. On June 30th, 1859, over 25,000 people gathered to watch Charles Blondin as he crossed Niagara Falls on a tiny rope. The distance was 1,100 feet, the slightest slip, and he would plunge 160 feet to his death. But he not only succeeded, he repeated the accomplishment several times, once on stilts, once with his manager on his back. He took a chair and a stove and sat down midway, cooked an omelet and ate it. On one occasion, he asked the spectators if they thought he could push a wheelbarrow across. They said yes. He asked a man, sir, do you think I could safely carry you across in this wheelbarrow? Of course you could, the spectator said. Then get in, the great acrobat invited, but the man refused. You know, it's one thing to profess belief, quite another to climb in the wheelbarrow. God invites us to climb in. More than anything else, God wants our belief. He wants us to trust him. In John 6 and verse 29, Jesus said, this is the work God wants that you believe in him. God asks us to trust him. It's really just that simple. He can span any distance. He can carry us over the waterfalls. What is impossible for us is easy for him. All he wants us to do is this. Climb in the wheelbarrow and trust him to do the work. Few chapters in the Bible illustrate the necessity of this radical faith more than the upsetting, disturbing story of Achan. Never heard of him? Well, you're not alone. We gravitate toward the happier stories in the Bible. We love Peter's redemption and Saul's conversion and Samson's restoration, but Achan's corruption not the stuff of Sunday school songs. The prior story in the book of Joshua ended on a high note. So the Lord was with Joshua. Jericho was demolished. No rock or enemy was left standing. The stage was set for the Hebrews to run the Canaanite table. The soldiers were emboldened and Joshua's face was on the evening news. The scripture says the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout all the country. So, that's such a great word, so the Lord was with him. The glory days had begun, but then the so became a but. Point one, distrust led to disobedience. But Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things. So the Lord was angry 
with the Israelites. Achan was the son of Carmi, a descendant of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. We don't know much about Achan, but we know this. He had a wife. He had a family. Later on, we'll read that he had oxen and donkeys, sheep in a tent. He had a place in the bloodline of Judah. But most of all, he had trouble. He had trouble trusting God. He blatantly and deliberately violated this command from God. God said before Jericho, do not take any of the things set apart for destruction or you yourselves will be completely destroyed and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. The command was clear. Don't touch the stuff. Don't make necklaces out of gold. No souvenirs. No trinkets. No Jericho jewelry. No kidding. Why the strict orders? Well, simple. God had, had high hopes for these Hebrew people. Through them, the scriptures would be written. The prophets would come. The Messiah would descend so God jealously guarded their hearts he wanted them to trust him in him alone rely on their strength no their resources no their ability no the glory days would happen to the degree that they trusted him hasn't this been the message in Joshua's book so far God is the hero of the book who opened the Jordan River, who led the people across, who made the personal appearance to Joshua, who brought down the Jericho walls, who fought for and delivered the Hebrew people, God. God was the sole source of their strength and he knew what would happen. He knew what would happen. If the Hebrew people collected treasures. You see, these were simple Bedouins. They were conceived and born in the wilderness. They were, well, they were hillbillies in Times Square. The gold would bedazzle them. The harems would hypnotize them. The shekels, the jewelry, the silk. They might turn from trusting God and begin trusting stuff. Achan did. Achan crossed the line. He turned his heart over to treasures. And God was jealous. The consequences were immediate and severe. Joshua's army suffered its first defeat. Point number two, disobedience led to defeat. About eight miles north of Jericho sat the encampment of Ai. Joshua circled the name of the city on his wall map and, and he told his officers to attack. Flush with Jericho victory, he assumed the small town would be easy pickings. I mean, the entire village had a population of around 12,000, while Joshua had that many people on his night shift watch. So he reduced his battalion to 3,000 and told them to attack. Boy, did he live to regret that decision. The town, as it turned out, was like a kennel of pit bulls. Joshua's entire division raced back. They were discouraged, they were disheveled, and they were beaten. In fact, we wonder if the village of Ai got its name from the Hebrews who ran back to Joshua yelling, Ai, 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 Ai. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 men who were retreating down the slope. The Israelites were paralyzed with fear at this turn of events and their courage melted away. The commander Joshua didn't know what to think. See, he was coming off a string of victories and miracles. He was undefeated. He was undaunted. He was the unquestioned conqueror of the Canaanite people. And now this? His mighty men crawled beneath their 
blankets in their tents and trembled. Joshua and the elders of Israel tore their clothing in dismay. They threw dust on their heads. They bowed face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening. Joshua and his people, well, they all had a meltdown. Joshua unloaded a prayer of anguish before God. He said, for when the Canaanites and all the other people living near the land hear about it, they will surround us and wipe our name off the face of the earth. And then what will happen to the honor of your great name? Joshua was undone. Gratefully, God was not done. But the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? Joshua pulled himself to his feet and God told him, Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they have not only stolen them, but have lied about it and hidden the things among their own belongings. That is why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now Israel itself has been set apart for destruction. I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things that were set apart for destruction. You see, they lost the battle because they lost God's favor. And they lost God's favor because they disobeyed God's command. It's not that the people of Ai were strong. It's that the Hebrew camp was infected Distrust had crept in on a snake's belly and contaminated the people. And God told Joshua to, in so many words, find the rotten apple before it ruined the whole bunch. And so that defeat led to disclosure. Now, if you haven't read this chapter, you might want to prepare yourself for a very disturbing series of events. Joshua initiated a tent to tent search. The result, well, a discovery. Achan was brought before the Lord. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, by telling the truth. Make your confession. Tell me what you have done. Don't hide it from me. Achan replied, it is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. They are hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. It's not hard to envision Achan's stumble in Jericho, is it? Along with the other soldiers, he was walking through the fallen city. The walls were down. The rubble was everywhere. Conquest complete. All the spoils of Jericho lay unprotected. The gold, the coin, the fine garments. Everyone, not just Achan, but everyone saw the stuff Everyone else remembered God's command and avoided this stuff. They saw the treasures and kept going. But Achan, his confession, he said, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. I saw, I wanted I took. Others saw. Others surely wanted. But no one else took. Why? Why did Achan take what was not his to take? We can only speculate. Maybe he wanted an ace in the hole, something to fall back on in case the Hebrews lost. Maybe he wanted a nest egg retirement fund to use when the Hebrews won. Maybe he just wanted some negotiating power in case he got taken captive. Maybe he wanted to impress his wife and his family and his friends. 
Whatever the reason, it boils down to this. Achan did not trust God. He did not trust God to provide for him. He did not trust God to protect him. So Achan took matters into his own hands. More literally, he took the treasure into his own hands and then into his own tent. And then he entangled his family in the deceit. And God was not fooled. In fact, God was angry. I think some backstory can help us understand God's displeasure. Think about God's provision for Achan. Not once in his life had he ever gone hungry. He grew up with a daily rain of manna and daily provision of quail. I mean, he may have grown weary of manna bread and quail burgers, but he never got hungry. Not once. Of late, he had been enjoying a feast. This side of the Jordan, the Hebrews had been living off of crops that they had not planted and vineyards that they didn't build. They had been enjoying figs and wine and barley. God took care of his people. He, he gave them not just food and not just provision, but he also gave them clothing and good health. Did you know this? Look at Deuteronomy 8.4. Moses reminded the people, your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. God echoed the message. During the 40 years that I led you through the desert, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. Remarkable provision from God's hand. The following phrases were never heard in the wilderness. Hey, new sandals, where did you get them? I need some, mine have worn out. No one ever said, hey, I need to soak my bunions in Epsom salts. My dogs are barking. Their feet never hurt. Oh, bummer, my robe has another rip in it. Their clothing was never torn. Podiatrists, tailors, and cobblers had a lot of time on their hands in the wilderness. God provided for them, and Achan benefited from that provision. Achan witnessed God's power like the others. Achan crossed the river on dry ground. He watched the walls shake at the blast of a trumpet. He enjoyed front row seats at God's deliverance display. Achan, one could argue, had enjoyed a pampered life. No want for food. No need for clothing, never a blister or a bunion. All God's provision, power, and to add one more, God's promise. Again, quoting Moses. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valley and hills. A land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. God, who had kept all of his promises, promised even more. He guaranteed a promised land life to the settlers. You see, Achan did not have a reason to worry, yet still he worried. In spite of God's provision, power, and promise, Achan chose to trust stuff. And in the rubble of Jericho, in the shadow of a fallen wall, he saw the glint of gold. And he paused, and he glanced to the right, then back to the left to see if anyone was watching. And when he thought no one was looking, he saw, he wanted, and he took. He, react, he reenacted the most ancient of sins. Didn't Eve do likewise? Didn't God provide for her? All the fruit of the Garden of Eden was hers to enjoy. The cantaloupe, the bananas, the grapes, the plums, all hers. Only one fruit, only one fruit was forbidden. And the question entered her mind on the hiss of a snake. Has God really told you to avoid the forbidden fruit. She said, well, we can eat any fruit, but this one, if we eat it, we die. Really? Or 
do you eat it and live? Satan raised the question and left Eve standing in the shadow of a doubt. Hmm, she thought. Maybe God is holding out on me. Maybe I better take matters into my own hand. In the same way that Achan reached for the treasure, she reached for the fruit. She saw that the tree was beautiful and wanted the wisdom that it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Sound familiar? She wanted. She saw. She took. The plucking of the fruit was an admission of her heart. She didn't trust God. When it came right down to it, though God had proven he would take, and take good care of her, she did not trust God. And since the success of Eden depended upon her trust, she and Adam were banished. And since the conquest of Canaan depended upon trust, Achan was punished severely, extremely. He and his family were executed. His possessions were burned. What a sobering story. It, it almost seems out of context, doesn't it, with the, the rest of the book of Joshua. Thus far, every turn of the page has brought good news and great progress and breakthroughs and miracles. And then all of a sudden, this, this minor chord, corruption, deception, and death. Something similar happens in the New Testament. The church, you remember, was, was born in an era of glory days, miracles and sermons and baptisms and growth. The, the book of Acts is kind of like a book of Joshua, a New Testament version. And the book is all good news until you reach the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Like Achan, they lied like Achan, they died. It is as if in these chosen generations, there were these two pockets of corruption. And God in his sovereignty determined to not only remove them, but send a message to all of us. That what I really want is trust. Just trust. It's common to read the story of Achan in the book of Joshua and think, boy, I'm certainly glad that God doesn't strike people dead for distrust these days. Don't be so sure he doesn't. That dead church on the corner, the dead faith of your ancestors, the dead marriage of your friends. Disbelief can be fatal. You see, promised land happens not through gold or silver or raiment or power, but through God. Glory days happen to the degree that we trust him. So what would a search of your tent reveal? Achan placed his security in Babylonian clothing and gold and coins. What about you? Any clandestine loyalties? Any secret idols? Are you trusting in anything except God? It really boils down to this. This is the big point. It's a dangerous thing to trust in things. It really is. King Stuff is a rotten ruler. He never satisfies. He rusts. He rots. 
He loses his value. He goes out of style. For all the promises he makes, he cannot keep a single one. King stuff will break your heart. Don't let him break yours. Why don't you examine your own heart today? Examine your own life. Better still, take your life into the presence of the King of Kings and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I believe that you and you alone can walk me through this life. And I'm going to allow you to take me into the promised land life. You and you alone. <laughs> Climb into the wheelbarrow. He is capable and he is able and he will make sure that you get across to the other side safely. Amen? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the stories in Scripture that remind us to be careful in our lives. Lord, we love the stories of great victory, and yet, Lord, we need stories like this that sober us and that challenge us. Father, for those secret sins in our own lives, we ask for your help for your strength. Would you have mercy upon us? And would you create within us a deeper, more abiding faith? Thank you, Lord. This is our prayer through Christ. Amen.